For thousands of years, people have gazed up at the heavens and read messages in stars. From studying the skies, astrologers have predicted an endless list of world events, including natural disasters, stock market crashes, assassination attempts, and the birth of Jesus Christ. Astrologers have been prized by world leaders from ancient Greek generals to 20th century American presidents, and epoch-making decisions around the world are still made according to the arrangement of the stars in the sky. But can the movements of the planets truly affect events on Earth? How can astrologers look at charts of the heavens and predict the outcome of a journey? Marriage? A war? Is our future really written in the stars? In 18th century England, there were two men whose backgrounds could not have been more different. One was a humble ironmonger, the other King George III of England. Despite this, their lives were full of extraordinary parallels. They inherited their father's businesses in the same month, married on the same day, fathered the same number of boy and girl children, were ill at the same time, and suffered the same accidents. Even their deaths were separated by only a few hours. They weren't related by blood, but they were astrological twins, born at virtually the same time and only a few miles apart, and their horoscopes were identical. According to astrological belief, the similar pattern of their lives was entirely to be expected. Astrology, in some form, is familiar to everyone. Millions of people read their horoscope in the media each day, and even the most skeptical know their own zodiac sign. What they may not realize as they scan the newspaper columns is that they are the beneficiaries of the most far-reaching intellectual enterprise in human history. Known as the Queen of Sciences, Astrology is our most ambitious attempt to combine science and philosophy into an overall explanation of destiny, and it's as old as recorded history. It began 5,000 years ago as people watched and noted the movement of the stars in the sky. Excited by these observations, they proposed a link between movements in the heavens and human lives on Earth. Since then, astrologers have maintained that there is a meaningful connection between planets and people, but they have never agreed on how or why. Astrology has stood the test of time. It's as popular now as it has ever been and flourishes in every corner of the globe. Cambridge University historian Nick Campion has made an academic study of astrology's changing role. Astrology is actually infinitely flexible. We just can't get away from the fact that it's one of the most accurate descriptions of character we have, and it can predict the future. Robert Curry is a prominent astrologer whose London astrology shop attracts thousands of clients each year. I think the reason for the success and popularity of astrology is because it is a truth. It is, a, it is something that is fundamental. I feel that astrology comes from something higher. It's as if it's part of the universe. Sometimes when I was doing charts in consultation, I'd get a chill down my back, down my spine, because people would say things that were so uncannily true in accordance with the chart. For most people, a horoscope means a brief impersonal prediction in a newspaper or on TV. Shelley von Strunkel is a consultant astrologer who also writes popular newspaper Sun Sign columns in Britain and America. These are designed to give the individual a chance to think about their day to come. It's a bit like a weather report for a specific part of the country. But these horoscopes refer solely to the signs of the zodiac, sometimes called sun signs. The zodiac is the name given to the band of constellations in the sky through which the sun, moon, and planets appear to pass as they journey through the heavens. 
The Romans compared the movement of the planets through this starry backdrop to a chariot race. The sun, moon, and planets are the chariots, and the constellations are the racetrack. The zodiac is divided into 12 divisions, or signs. Everyone born during the 30 days it takes the sun to travel through one division is said to belong to that sign, and astrologers believe that they will share its characteristics and influences. Sun sign predictions are very generalized, but despite this, newspaper horoscope columns have a large following. Erin Sullivan, an astrological writer and teacher, has also written popular columns. Sun sign astrology, as it appears in the newspapers, interests millions of people, which is often why some people buy a particular paper. Some people who write these columns are terribly successful. They're very, very good. Um, they have an excellent vocabulary. They are able to work the symbolism quite nicely. You'll find that some of them are, are actually very good, and some of them are absolute drivel. It's just ridiculous. A true horoscope is more than just a sun sign description. It's a personal chart describing the astrological influences relating solely to that individual. The chart is cast by an astrologer and is known as a natal chart. This is a map of where the planets are at the time of your birth. And it is a unique map that relates to you in particular. From that information, an astrologer can then tell you about your potential, the type of person you are, the type of experiences you may have during your life, and how you could uh, perhaps understand the difficult areas in your personality. Astrologers claim that a natal chart can reveal whether a person is outgoing, anxious, musical, technical, emotional, and it can indicate an individual's most likely professions. The chart is a snapshot of the heavens at the exact moment of birth. The pattern of the skies can change in as little as four minutes, so no one except those born within moments of each other in the same place could lay claim to the same horoscope. Astrological twins like George III and the Ironmonger are considered more likely to have similar lives than identical twins born a few crucial minutes apart. Many people don't know the exact time of their birth, but this doesn't prevent them from having a horoscope cast. Usually, astrologers cast a chart for sunrise on the birth date, but there is a longer process called rectification, whereby the astrologer works backwards from the events of a person's life to their most probable birth time. Anyone who knows their birthday can visit an astrologer to have their horoscope drawn. It's not a lot different from going to seeing any other consultant, except first you've got to provide your birth date, place, and time. Normally, before the individual attends the appointment, the astrologer will have calculated a chart, a horoscope. Natal charts can be drawn up for anything which has a birth date. Cities, even structures, can have charts. The Berlin Wall, for example, built in August 1960, had a horoscope which predicted a time of instability and change for November 1989, the date when this historic barrier fell. Nick Campion has even drawn charts for countries. So what we do is take particular politically important moments for each country. For one country, it may be a revolution, for another, a coronation. So for the United States, we take July the 4th, 1776, which is when the wording of the Declaration of Independence was agreed, and this is when the United States celebrates its birthday. Drawing charts for places, groups, or countries is known as mundane astrology. It's the most ancient form of astrology and the one most commonly used by world leaders in history. These horoscopes show the most auspicious time to begin important enterprises, whether it's making an important speech or declaring war. Astrologer Joan Quigley used mundane astrology to select the time for Ronald Reagan's second inauguration as President of the United States. She chose 11.57 a.m. in a chart set for Washington, D.C. And it is a spectacular chart. The sun was in the sign of Aquarius, Ronald Reagan's sign. And Jupiter, the planet of growth, expansion, and opportunity, was next to the moon, which signals 
popularity. There could have been no better indication for a successful administration. The role of Quigley in the White House was a highly secret one, but politically important dates in modern Malaysia and India are still decided by public astrological readings. A horoscope is based upon a map of the heavens. It's a very detailed map, and astrologers are grateful that computers have taken over the time-consuming task of physically drawing up the chart. Henry Weingarten is a financial astrologer who generates thousands of charts each year. The role of the computer is similar to what it was to have students for many years ago. They're doing the routine calculations for you, but the actual analysis is done by a professional. The map comes to life when a skilled astrologer begins to read it. Astrology is a technical subject, requiring considerable knowledge of the planetary influences revealed in the chart. Practice and experience are the key. Hmm, your love life's not very satisfactory. Astrologers do not claim that horoscopes categorically predict the future. They say that the stars don't compel, they only incline. So no horoscope would declare that an accident is going to happen, only that a particular moment is accident prone. Astrologers aim to provide their clients with extra information, thus adding to choice, not restricting it. Many people find that having a horoscope read provokes thought and forces concentration on the issues. It helps them with decision-making. How can analyzing a map of the heavens affect the personalities and actions of people on Earth? The solution lies in astrologers' belief in the nature of planetary influence, a belief that began 5,000 years ago. Around 3000 BC, the foundations of astrology were laid among the ancient civilizations of Mesopotamia, now Iraq. Here in a region called Babylonia, the first astrologers stood on their 300 foot high ziggurats and gazed at the stars. They noticed how the most obvious heavenly bodies, the planets, seemed to follow strangely erratic paths, sometimes passing each other at great speed, sometimes slowing down and even going backwards. These ancient observers worked out what 20th century scientists using space probes and telescopes have confirmed, that the planets have regular orbits and that they vary in position, brightness and speed as they follow their paths. The Babylonians also began to record a connection between these patterns and events on Earth. The Mesopotamian philosophy, which continued well into classical Greece and Rome and into Renaissance Europe, was that the whole world was alive. And by the whole world, they meant the universe, the stars, as well as the Earth. And they continually believed that nature was talking to them. And behind nature were the forces, which they called the gods and goddesses. For the Babylonians, the forces of nature extended into space which they saw as inseparable from earthly life. These first astrologers saw the planets as embodying the powerful yet capricious gods and goddesses, each planet resembling in appearance and movement the character of its god. The Babylonians and later the Greeks and Romans believed that these planets, all different, exerted their influences upon life on Earth and that the closer each planet locked in its orbit came to the Earth, the more strongly people on Earth were affected by it. This ancient idea of the planets as forces with distinctive personalities and effects is still the cornerstone of astrological belief and the basis on which horoscopes are interpreted. The core function of a horoscope is to record the positions of the planets so that their influences can be assessed. This chart, the horoscope of John F. Kennedy, is recorded in a shorthand developed by astrologers through the centuries. 
Although this shorthand has changed little over the years, the mechanics of drawing the chart have been transformed by computers. But astrologers still learn to calculate and draw charts in the traditional way, using astrological tables. If we wanted to calculate the horoscope for President Kennedy, we would first of all need to look at his time, date and place of birth. Now he was born at 17 minutes past three in the afternoon in Brookline, Massachusetts on the 29th of May, 1917. Our first simple calculation is to work out what the time was in London, which we would call Greenwich Mean Time. And the reason is quite simple. It's that all the planetary tables are calculated for London. Now with that information, we can then go to the table of houses and make one slight further adjustment and then look up his rising sign, which happened to be Libra. The rising sign is a sign arising over the eastern horizon when you were born. According to all astrological traditions, the rising sign or ascendant is as important in your horoscope and character as the sun sign. So taking President Kennedy's chart, his rising sign is Libra, we mark that carefully on the left hand side and then we fill in the rest of the signs of the zodiac around the outside through right round the circle, round back to Virgo. The chart has a further set of divisions. These are the houses. They refer to practical areas of human life such as family, money, travel and work. The next stage is to work out where the planets were at the time of birth. Now, we would go for this information to a book called An Ephemeris, and this will list the positions of the planets for every day of the year, and you can buy a volume which lists them for 100 years, if you, if you wish. Taking President Kennedy's chart, for example, he was born with the sun in Gemini and the moon in Virgo. Now, the planetary positions in the Ephemeris are going to be given to the nearest degree. Uh, very precisely, so we're not just looking at the sign the planet is in, but also the precise degree of the sign. And then we go around and do the same with the other eight planets. Once the planets have been recorded on the chart, interpretation can begin. The astrologer must know the influences identified with each planet. In Kennedy's chart, the most significant planets are Jupiter, the planet of leadership and success, Mercury, the planet of the mind and communication, Mars, the planet of war, Venus, the planet of love, and Pluto, planet of death and endings. The relationship of planets to each other can be as important as their individual effect. One powerful grouping is a key feature of Kennedy's chart. It's interesting to see that he had a very, very powerful conjunction of planets in Taurus. Now a conjunction uh, means uh, that planets are linked very tightly within eight degrees in a sign. And you had Jupiter, which is uh, a planet of optimism and growth. Mercury, which is the planet which ruled his uh, mental processes, his ideas, and Mars, which is a planet of anger and aggression and in politics indicates war. Now Taurus is a sign which is very persistent and very stubborn and achieves its aims without deviation. It will find a course and stick to it. I think that this is the particular alignment which indicates uh, his success in standing up to the Soviet Union in Berlin and in Cuba. And of course, looking at the chart very literally, Mars uh, in ancient times ruled arrows and spears. And of course, in modern terms, that's missiles. The angles between planets in a chart, or aspects in astrological terms, are also important. The next stage of interpreting the planets is to look at the planetary aspects. Now the aspects are precise distances between planets. Some of them are difficult and others are easy. Now if we look at Kennedy's chart, then the Moon was making two difficult aspects, one to Venus and one to the Sun. The Moon square to Venus is very difficult emotionally and this would represent the deep internal pull that he felt between his love for Jackie on the one hand and his high regard for her as a wife and mother of his children 
and his desire to explore relationships with other women, with Marion Monroe and uh, other more like, alluring characters. And the same would have happened between the moon and the sun, which often represents divorce or the, the breakup of a marriage. So perhaps had Kennedy lived, we would have seen his relationship with Jackie Kennedy running into the public trouble that we already know it was in privately. If we look at Pluto in Kennedy's chart, then Pluto was in ancient mythology the god of the underworld. In modern astrology, it's a planet which represents endings, whole phases of life coming to an end. Now, it's intriguing to note that when Kennedy was born, Pluto was exactly overhead at Dallas. So that is how to calculate and interpret a chart. Now, of course, these days, any computer can do the calculation, but there's nothing to replace the astrologer's skill in actually interpreting a chart and bringing it to life. Modern astrologers often help clients in their personal lives, but predicting events has always been part of astrology. The most famous astrologers have foretold major events, even the beginnings of new eras. Nearly 2,000 years ago, a small group of Persian astrologers observed an unusual conjunction in the heavens. They discovered that this had been predicted by the astrologer philosopher Zoroaster and that it would herald the birth of a new king. The astrologers set off on a long journey, working out the time and place of the new king's birth from their astrological observations. But when they reached the spot, they found only a baby lying in a stable. The astrologers were the Magi, and the baby was Jesus. Astronomer Dr. Percy Seymour has studied the skies as they were at the time of the birth of Christ in order to discover what led the Magi to their historic conclusion. He found a rare association between the planet Jupiter, traditionally associated with kings, and Saturn, associated with the Jewish people. These two planets actually did a dance in the sky and came together three times in one year. And that's called a triple conjunction. But there was something even more significant about this triple conjunction. It occurred in the constellation of Pisces. And Pisces was associated with the area around Bethlehem. And a triple conjunction in Pisces only takes place once every 900 years. And I think what, what they did was they said that a king of Jewish origin was about to be born in Bethlehem. So they went in search of this king. They might even have made use of the census that was going on to find out which baby was born at that right time. And then they told his mother that he was born to the king of the Jews. When the child of a royal lineage was due to be born, there was only one person more anxious than the expectant father, a court astrologer. In a Macedonian palace in 356 BC, the court was expecting the new child of the king, Philip II, and Olympias, Philip's wife, had gone into labor. The astrologer pleaded with Olympias to try to delay the birth as long as possible. If she could do so, her child would have an extraordinary horoscope and would become one of the greatest leaders the world had ever known. Somehow, Olympias managed to do as the astrologer asked, and eventually her son was born into his epoch-making horoscope. Olympias had given birth to Alexander the Great. Things don't always turn out this way. Robert Curry was offered a choice of birth dates for his daughter. We spent ages looking at it. We worked it out. It was a tremendous responsibility. And we picked this new moon in Pisces, which we thought was going to be the most wonderful chart, and it fitted in with our charts and had it all planned. So my wife then went into the hospital, and we waited for what to come around to help with indu induction. And nothing happened. There'd actually been a crisis on that, that morning. And we, it was only in the afternoon that she actually was born. And the end result was that the moon had changed signs. The horoscope was completely different. But uh, 
in fact, it's been the most wonderful thing. And I think the lesson for me is that you, you should just let fate take its course. The fortunes of astrology waxed and waned during the Middle Ages, but by the 16th century, astrology in Europe had become highly refined, well regarded, and an essential qualification for any educated person. Astrology was a mainstream academic subject taught in universities alongside mathematics, medicine, and astronomy, and was used by doctors, scientists, and high-ranking intellectuals. One of the most famous astrologers of all time was John Dee, who was a personal astrologer to Queen Elizabeth I of England. So we could say that he was responsible for some of the most important decisions taken in one of the most important reigns in English history. Dee's work included acting as a spy for Elizabeth. But astrology, not foreign intelligence, was the cornerstone of his instructions to his queen. He chose propitious dates for all important events. One of his greatest successes came in 1588, when he advised Elizabeth on the timing of England's victorious confrontation with the Armada, the invading naval force of Spain. The way he would have worked would be to have looked at Mars, which was England's planetary ruler, and if that was stronger than Jupiter, which was Spain's planetary ruler, he would have said the Armada would fail, as it did. And he would have looked at other factors, such as Mercury, which rules the winds, and he would have looked at Mercury and said, well, the Armada might be blown off course, as it was. This was the heyday of astrology. In the 1600s, there were more than 200 well-known astrologers working in London. People went to an astrologer when they were ill, when they had suffered a loss or reversal of fortune, or when they were considering marriage or business ventures. The first ever weekly horoscope dates from this time. It was called The Starry Messenger and was written by William Lilly, who was famous for predicting the Great Plague and the Great Fire of London. William Lilly practiced orrery astrology, an ancient method which is designed to answer specific questions such as whether a relationship will result in marriage or even the whereabouts of a lost ring. In the 20th century, we have come full circle back to finding personal astrologers next to political leaders and ordinary people seeking advice from newspaper horoscopes or their local astrologer. They have decisions to make and they use horoscopes to help them. During the Second World War, Hitler secretly employed an astrologer, Karl Kraft. The Allies discovered this and decided to employ one too. They hoped that their astrologer would come to the same conclusions as Kraft. When Kraft compared the charts of Rommel and Montgomery just before the North African campaign, he could see that Britain was certain to be the winner. Hitler's response was to put Kraft in jail and carry on with the ill-fated campaign. President Reagan was more inclined to follow the advice of his astrologer, Joan Quigley. Quigley's first success was to predict the attempt on Reagan's life. And thereafter, she was involved in all the major and many of the minor decisions of the presidency. When Quigley was doing her work, her calculations would be as precise as selecting the time that the president's aircraft, Air Force One, would leave on a trip for a summit conference so that a message would go from Mrs. Quigley to Mrs. Reagan to the president's office that the president's plane should take off at a specific hour for a summit meeting. And it did. In the winter of 86 to 87, Quigley was worried about the movements of Uranus and Saturn. She felt that they indicated a danger of assassination. For four months, Reagan stayed inside the White House, emerging only once give the State of the Union address. Every event in the President's life was timed by the casting of horoscopes. But how did horoscopes help Reagan with the bigger issues of the presidency? 
Joan Quigley is credited as being one of the people who told Ronald Reagan that he could do business with the Soviet Union. Now, for the first part of his presidency, Reagan had been sounding off against the evil empire and there'd been this amazing arms build up. And then Joan comes along and looks at Gorbachev's horoscope and says to Reagan, look, this is a man that we can do business with. Ronald Reagan used astrology to help him make decisions which altered world history. But millions of ordinary people use astrology in their everyday life. They use it for all kinds of purposes. Astrology claims to give insight, and there is no area of life where insight, and thus astrology, cannot be employed. Astrology offers help in everything, from finding a lost purse to timing a journey. Horoscopes assist people with problems in their personal lives. Astrologers claim that a natal chart can help you know yourself and thus be more equipped to meet challenges. A horoscope is the most egocentric document imaginable, a map of the universe with the individual at its center. For many people, including princesses, this chart is the place where revelations about past, present, and future are to be found. Diana had used astrology quite consistently and, as far as we can gather, quite successfully. Now, she was born with the sun in Cancer, which is responsible for the caring, compassionate, emotional side of her character, but also for that part of her which is so shy and withdrawn. Astrologers find Princess Diana's chart explains a great deal about her personality. A chart's a picture of what one experienced in childhood, and the moon opposite Uranus indicates a tumultuous childhood. And indeed, her mother did leave suddenly when she was a young child, and she acquired a new and not altogether popular stepmother shortly after. This position of the moon and Uranus in her chart marks then the tendency as an adult to react suddenly as well when she's hit with conflict, as we've seen to be the case. In a consultation, an astrologer would use these insights to give advice about the future. I think another way in which astrology was very important to Diana was in taking aspects of her chart which were difficult. For example, uh, I'm thinking of her moon in Aquarius squared to Venus, which is very, very difficult emotionally and been causing her great tension. And her astrologers showed her how this could be used positively because it's a very, very idealistic alignment. And that's when she started going to meet Mother Teresa and taking up radical charities such as AIDS and shaking hands with AIDS victims. Princess Diana's chart shows Saturn, the planet of duty and responsibility, challenged by Neptune, which represents disillusionment and disintegration. And her Venus, the planet of love and romance, is opposed by Pluto, the planet of hidden things, opposition, and endings. Buckingham Palace would have done well to have looked at Diana's horoscope. Had they done so, they would have seen somebody who just couldn't be contained in a tight, constricting atmosphere, who just couldn't obey the rules. And I think had they done so, they could have used the situation of the, the breakup of the marriage just so much more positively. But could a comparison of the prince and princess's charts have been the most useful way of avoiding a potentially disastrous marriage? Few astrologers would claim that charts can say whether two people will be happy together, but they do think that horoscopes can reveal potential problems. Prince Charles's chart shows his Venus next to Neptune in a position which indicates idealization of women, particularly his mother a definite problem for any wife to contend with. And a look at Princess Margaret's chart reveals an unhappy outcome for romance. It shows Venus, standing for love, opposed by Saturn, the planet of duty, foreshadowing the crisis in which she gave up the love of her life, a divorcee, to avoid a damaging scandal. Astrology is often used when people are thinking of marriage, Astrologers find that it's one of the most popular topics in their consultations. The questions are often about the chances of success in specific relationships. Astrologers such as Eugenie Di Serio in New York offer help in this area. 
in terms of relationships, astrology can really be an x-ray into a person's nature and a partner's nature. Of course, a lot of people have problems, you know, and they want to say, well, this is my birthday and this is my partner's and our relationship is in shambles. Do you think there's a way that we can find an answer to it? And we look, and usually the astrological um, signs in the chart will show if there's conflict or things people have to work around. We'll give them that advice. To help people avoid these kinds of difficulties, Eugenie operates an astrological dating service, which arranges astrologically compatible introductions on the Internet. Some people go to astrologers for medical advice, usually alongside conventional treatment. Medicine and astrology have been linked for thousands of years. Each part of the body is represented by a subdivision of the zodiac, and horoscopes are said to reveal potential health problems. Medicine isn't the only area where astrology claims some success. Astro-economists are a new breed of financial advisors who use this ancient art to help them play the stock markets. Some investment houses use astrological information as well as the more conventional sort of market predictors. Henry Weingarten has many successes to his credit. We have a proven track record. I called the Tokyo market crash two and a half years in advance to within two days. In Wall Street itself, people there are only interested, does it work? How often does it work? How reliable is it? And how much money can I make from it? These are not straightforward predictions. Each decision is based on information from dozens, sometimes hundreds of charts, which are interpreted and collated by the astrologer. I first decide where in the world I want to invest, looking at the horoscope of a given country and the horoscope of a given, given currency. Then I tend to look at the horoscope of the stock market or bourse involved, the sectors that we're interested in investing, and then finally the stock itself. Many market surprises, not all of them, uh, are chartable by astrology, such as the U.S. Mideast War, which is something we were anticipating. Business horoscopes seem to work in the same way as personal ones. They outline the influences, possibilities, and probable outcomes, and guide rather than dictate a decision. For those who use astrology this way, its validity is not in doubt. Others are less convinced. Scientists have difficulty accepting a system whose workings seem to have no plausible explanation. But astrologers have something new to offer the cynics, statistical evidence. The continued popular appeal of astrology is a puzzle to many 20th century scientists who regard it as a lingering superstition. In the 1950s, Michel Gauquelin, a French scientist and statistician, irritated by what he thought were astrology's bogus claims, set out to refute a statistical study in which the astrological writer Léon Lasson had connected horoscopes with choice of career. To his surprise, his results confirmed Lasson's original conclusions. He repeated the studies and found even more significant results. He turned up a very interesting result, looking at men who had excelled themselves in the medical profession. Medical scientists and physicians who had excelled, uh, won prizes, made discoveries, and he found out that these uh, men, they were mainly men at that time, they were mainly born when Saturn or Mars had reached its highest point in the sky. Gokula also found that what became known as the Mars effect was strongest among world-class athletes and that writers were significantly more likely to have had the moon rising in their charts. The striking thing for students of astrology is that these findings supported traditional beliefs about planetary influences. Gokulan's findings actually provides an underpinning of a belief from the ancient world that kings are born with Jupiter just rising or reaching its highest point. And this is why Jupiter became associated with kings and became the planet of kings. 
Although Gauquelin's work was scientifically rigorous, scientific journals were reluctant to publish it. Gauquelin went on, however, to make another statistical discovery. Some aspects of horoscopes are hereditary. This was not true of zodiac signs, which showed no special connection, but it did apply to planetary influences. And he was able to show that if Mars was rising, whether either the mother or father was born, then the child was also likely to be born with Mars rising. This evidence, although statistically valid, fails to impress most scientists. Parapsychologist Susan Blackmore needs more convincing. Almost all astrologers will claim that there is a relationship between the time and place you were born and your personality. So you can do, for example, my favorite sort of experiments are, are, are this sort. You might take, say, a dozen people and give an astrologer all the information he or she wants about those 12 people and also give the 12 birth times and dates as accurate as they want them and see whether the astrologer can match up those people, all the information, with those dates. Many experiments of that kind have been done and they can't. A similar piece of research showed that personality, as revealed in psychological tests, corresponded more closely with sun signs than with full natal horoscopes. I think the reason is that we all know our zodiac signs. In other words, those people in that experiment get that correlation because they, if you like, are turning themselves into whatever they think they should be according to what their sign is. Some scientists accept that astrologers are perceived as accurate by their clients. Psychologists in particular have been interested in explaining these successes. Carl Jung believed that there was a link between planets and earthly events, but that neither caused the other. They were both part of an overall synchronized pattern. Bob Breyer has a different theory as to how astrologers get results. It has nothing to do with the stars. It's something else. And I think that something else is probably extrasensory perception, ESP. Um, if astrology really worked the way many astrologers claim it does, that there's a direct correlation between the position of the heavens at the time of your birth and your subsequent actions, then the best astrologer would be a computer. But I think most astrologers feel that you can't do it just with a computer. There has to be an interpretation. And I think the interpretation is where ESP comes in. Many psychologists maintain that good astrologers, those who impress clients with the accuracy of their personality analysis and can pinpoint problem areas, achieve the result with a combination of skills. They may, for example, be excellent at picking up unconscious signals from their clients, or may simply be good at telling clients what they want to hear. I think the real power of astrology comes from people's desire to see themselves in the descriptions they read. So, for example, if I said to you, um, well, on the outside you appear really confident and relaxed, but underneath you're actually more worried than you seem. Now, that's true. Almost everybody will say that's true of them, but not true of other people, because you don't realize everybody else is like that, too. You can very easily come to believe that astrology has far more validity than, in fact, it does. But astrologers are equally convinced that a horoscope is valid in its own right. Their position is that good astrologers succeed because they are experienced at reading charts. I was asked to do a chart as a gift for a gentleman, someone I'd never met and given the birth time, date and place. And I, I did a tape for him and sent it off in the post and really thought nothing more about it until I got a phone call from his wife. She said my tape had helped her understand her husband better than she ever had before. Percy Seymour is one of the few scientists to develop a theory in the areas where real evidence does exist. He has sought an explanation for the connection which Gauquelin demonstrated between the position of planets and the lives of individuals. Seymour's theory is that planetary influence operates through a form of magnetism to which humans are sensitive. The mechanism is unclear, but we already know that the sun and the moon exert an influence on Earth. The full moon, for example, has long been associated with changes in human behavior, and the moon's phases are precisely linked to the ebb and flow of the tides. Animals certainly seem capable of responding to the moon's effect. 
Oysters, for example, open and close at irregular times each day. It was thought that this was a response to the rise and fall of the tides, but biologists discovered that even in still tanks in the dark, the oysters maintained their tidal lunar rhythm. And when oysters are transported a thousand miles from the coast, they change their rhythm to the moon cycle of their new home. Somehow, in their darkened tank, they can detect and respond to the phases of the moon. Activity on the surface of the sun more directly influences our atmosphere. Solar flares, magnetic storms on the sun, are associated with increased interference to radio transmissions and disruptions in human behavior. Road accidents increase up to four times during and just after these disturbances. Scientists accept that animals and humans can detect signals from close and powerful neighbors, such as the sun or moon. But what about the planets, which are much, much further away from Earth? Percy Seymour has a theory as to how the effects of even distant planets may be registered here. We all know that the sun and the moon have an effect on our Earth. How can the planets enter this scenario? How can they play a part, since they are so far away from us? And um, their distances makes their effect on us so very, very weak. I think this is where the sun comes into it. The sun can tune in to the weak tidal forces of the planets. And these weak tidal forces can be amplified by the sun's magnetic field so that the sun can disrupt in the form of violent storms. This affects the magnetic field of Earth. And since the magnetic field of Earth is known to affect a wide variety of organisms, it can have an effect on human beings as well. Seymour's idea is that the nervous systems of animals and humans act like aerials to detect the vibrations of the Earth's field, a complex symphony played by the constantly moving solar system. The first signals are etched onto our blank nervous systems even before we are born. I think that over the entire nine months when the fetus is in the womb, its developing aerial system which is its nervous system, is picking up um, tunes, melodies, magnetic music of the solar system. Once the fetus is born, most of its information will come via its five senses. But it might well be that in later life, the individual picks up the themes and melodies of the symphony that it heard while it was in the womb. It will be predispose this individual to behave in a certain way. The debate continues. But while scientists argue, astrologers are more popular than for the last 300 years. We still don't know what, if any, scientific basis exists for astrology. But for centuries, the same message has emerged over and over again. The planets are part of the same system as Earth, and somehow their influence is felt in human lives. For the thousands of astrologers who help their clients to focus upon their lives and problems, the stars are more than a benevolent presence in the night sky. They are the guardians of our strengths and weaknesses, our desires and ambitions. They are our destiny.